what I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I never thought that I'd have a show that went for this long. That's crazy. What's the real reason why Meghan won't be attending King Charles's coronation? Could it be her many complaints, even about insignificant things? A few days before the wedding, she was upset about something and it made me cry and it really hurt my feelings. There's no class on how to, how to speak, how to cross your legs. No one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not gonna know that. That's me late at night Googling how, what's the national, I've got to learn this. I or could it be the complaints coupled with the personality traits that were obvious long before William warned Harry about proposing, long before William and Meghan's heated discussion? In linguistics, it's recognized that people give clues to their identity through the words they use. It's important to look at what they say as well as what they don't say. So, I understand you watched Suits last night. Officer, I would never do that. So, I understand you watched Suits last night. No, officer, I didn't. In the first example, there's no explicit denial. The minimal response, no, is missing. And would never isn't specific to the question. The speaker says what he would never do, ideally, not what he didn't do. This means he could still be guilty of this. The second example is different. Here we have an explicit minimal response, no, followed by a verb with an implicit negation specific to the question. Thus, unlike the first example, this is a reliable denial. In conclusion, words matter. Subscribe for more videos and click the like button, which helps very much. Let's get this organic analysis started. Make sure you watch until the end, because things are about to get amazing. Speaking in rehearsed monologues as if she's constantly auditioning for a role is one of Meghan's defining characteristics. Let's pay attention to how she answers and then compare the answer to another interview. Uh, let's talk about the TIG. Yeah. So you've said the name represents the moment where you got it. Talk a little bit about that moment. Yeah, I mean, I think we all have catalyst moments in our life. And for me, when I uh, started the TIG, the namesake for it was after this glass of wine, it's a, it's a type of wine called Tignanello, but in the States they sort of butcher the name and say Tignanello. And it was my first time having a, a sip of this wine where I wasn't just like, it's red wine or it's white wine. It was a moment of, oh, this is different. Oh, I get it now when people talk about the legs or the body or the structure of something. So for me, it was a, a pivotal moment because it was seeing the nuance in something that I had never seen before. So the Tig then became my personal nickname of all those aha moments of getting it in a more profound way than you had before. Here, she specifically asked to explain the name, so in that sense, her answer makes sense. However, the reason why we know it's rehearsed is because she was asked the same question on Larry King. Her answer was almost identical. Megan is also the founder of the TIG. What is that? <laughs> Uh, the TIG? TIG. Well, you know, it's so funny. The namesake actually comes from a wine that I had that was an aha moment, Tignanello, which people sort of pronounce Tignanello here in the States. And it became my nickname for moments of getting it, moments of clarity where something is not just red or white as with the wine, but really has some depth to it. So, yeah, the site has been a really nice resource for me to share all of those passions. It's a website. It's a website, yes. And all King wanted to know was that it was a website. But because Megan treats every interview as an audition, we get the same monologues. It's relevant for at least two different reasons. One, because answers that are rehearsed to this degree can come across as out of context and insincere, and thus negate what the person is overpaid to advocate for. And two, because it can be used to control every situation she's in, directing the conversation. Just like when she interviews herself to make unsubstantiated claims. I mean, certainly when it comes to the pay gap, do I have personal experience with it? Absolutely. Um, do I hope to see that change the more that we're talking about it and being very comfortable in those conversations? Yes. Every answer she gives is like an audition, self-branding, rather than an actual conversation between two people. Or what about the soap commercial story that's identical from interview to interview and sounds out of place every time? Relax, I'm not going to play it. I would never do that.
All I would do is play a very short segment. A pivotal moment reshaped my notion of what is possible. Because this is the exact same word choice as this. So for me, it was a, a pivotal moment because... She so says it after it a, a pause a and a self-repair. So this me, indicates a, that this is a go-to formulation, just like she uses the word interesting or funny as starters. Well, you know, it's so funny that it's so interesting to see that. I mean, I think what's been really interesting and it's, you know, it's so interesting. And I actually, I gave a speech. Um, These repetitions make it difficult for people to know what she actually finds interesting or funny. Generally, Megan speaks in very long terms, with lots of so-called transition-relevance places. Transition-relevance places, or TRPs for short, are spaces in a conversation where one speaker is done talking, and the other speaker can begin their turn. Is the turn intonationally complete? Is there a falling or rising tone? Falling tone indicates completion, while rising tone can indicate that the speaker wants to continue, unless they're asking a question. Or is the turn grammatically complete? So, what are your plans for the summer? Thanks for asking. I think we might travel to... Let's go for lunch, huh? Sure. In this passage and in this entire interview, there are many possible grammatical completion points. However, Megan speaks so fast that it becomes a signal to the interviewer, Jacqueline, that she shouldn't overlap. And as a result, Jacqueline doesn't say very much. What else does she implicitly tell us about herself in this passage? Even though this is supposed to be a funny story about her nickname, she manages to sneak in a lot of self-praise, talking about seeing nuances and having a profound experience. All just from having a drink. Who would have thought? Next, we have another repetition of the word interesting. Interesting how every question is interesting in this interesting interview, which ironically, makes it doubtful that it's interesting. Yes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your experience in the casting room and, and, and your experience as a diverse woman yeah. in the casting room. I mean, I think what's so interesting is, um, you know, I'm born and raised in L.A., so that in and of whoop, itself... Whoop. Are you? L.A. Oh, my... Where'd you go to high school? Oh, wait, I didn't go to high school in L.A., but we'll get back to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wait, table's turn. Now it's like, we could do like an interview for the TIG. Where'd that, you go to high school? What's it. your favorite food? Um, I guess it wasn't so funny after all. And then another repetition. This time, it's the word funny. And suits, which we're now in our sixth season. Who would have thought? Like, <laughs> oh, thank you. We're so lucky. And initially, you were approached by someone else to start the site, but then you decided to do it on your own. Talk, oh, yeah. Talk I'm, a little bit about Well, you know what's so funny is like... Jacqueline has barely reached oh, yeah. a possible talk completion a point, oh. grammatically and intonationally, before Megan cuts in with another repetition of the word funny. What is funny, however, is that Megan knows exactly what Jacqueline will ask her, because Megan's explained the past events she wants to talk about, which is the only reason why Jacqueline would know about them in the first place. Thus, what we're about to hear is entirely deliberate self-branding, where Megan gets the opportunity to sound as profound as her website. And you guys will encounter this, and, and you probably do, is when you're being pulled in so many different directions and things at the onset sound like such a great idea, but when you really listen to your internal compass, it's very easy for you, if you're listening to it, to say, that's just not right. And you do that gut check. And this was exactly what happened to me with that experience because... And with you, you she addresses the crowd. And what she implicitly states is masked as concern for their well-being or success. She implicitly states that she was attractive enough to not only being pulled in many directions, but also to saying no to something which didn't feel right. This level of attractiveness is highlighted by the fact that this is a positive problem to have or no problem at all. The real goal with this is to highlight her attractiveness, and not how much of a gut check she did. A company had approached me and they basically just wanted to do meganmarkle.com and put up lots of cute outfits and profit off of all of them, all of which is fine, by the way, if that's what you're into. Um, but for me, there was so much more that I wanted to share, and I really do have an organic and deep love of travel and of food and, and also of writing. You know, I love writing these think pieces and op-eds about self-empowerment on the site. All of which is fine if that's what you're into, she says. 
even though she's actually stating the opposite, that it isn't fine because it didn't match the complexity of her goals. However, food, travel, and the modern-day buzzword empowerment, which is intentionally vague because it's devoid of actual meaning, don't necessarily sound complex, and don't necessarily sound like they couldn't have been contained in the name MeganMarkle.com. So, with this, she gets to implicitly state that she made the demands, and not the other way around. This is in line with how sensitive it is to her to be associated with influential people, calling Serena Williams a dear friend several times in her podcast, which is actually a strange thing for dear friends to do. But let's not think about that. In the next passage and several other passages, Megan mentions influential people, showing us what's important to her and giving us a possible indication of how she climbed the ladder by associating with these people without having an actual friendship with them. Even in her podcast, she spoke about ambitions in the context of dating Harry. So I, um, I severed ties with that company. I started developing the site on my own. And then, do you guys know the website, The Coveteur? So I'm really good friends with Jake Rosenberg, who's the creative director on it. And he had seen sort of the way that this company was putting my site together. He's like, I beg you, please do not go down this path. He's like, use our graphic designer from Coveteur. Let them do the design aesthetic of the TIG, which we worked on painstakingly. With the hyperbole, I beg you, vowel stress and please, and overemphasis on the alleged hard work with the design, Megan continues to enhance her attractiveness by making this website sound extraordinary and most importantly, different from anything else. Um, and really putting my own personal thumbprint on it. It's my handwriting on the site. I mean, the logo is designed like a wine glass with the drop of the wine is the eye on the, oh yeah. It's, all it's my baby, so I'm very wine. proud of it still after two years. Um, In terms of intonation and syntax, Megan's reached a completion point. Jacqueline recognizes this and starts talking. I on the, oh yeah. It's, all it's my baby, so I'm very wine. proud of it still after two years. Megan, however, ignores this, and she does more than just ignore it. She raises her voice to silence Jacqueline, who hasn't said anything for almost two minutes, as she goes on with self-praise, disguised as a cute addition to the story. She also uses the interjection, um, which in conversations can be used as a continuation marker, showing Jacqueline that she wants to continue speaking. In this situation, it's interesting how Jacqueline, unlike Megan, shows awareness of this interruption because she widens her smile, giggles, and makes a small jump in the chair while Megan unapologetically continues speaking. So, as we've observed from the beginning of this monologue, I mean interview, Megan keeps showing Jacqueline how she wants the dynamic between the two of them to be. And it tells us something about the difference between Jacqueline and Megan as far as self-awareness is concerned. But no, I mean, I really think it was one of those moments that had I gone in that other direction with these people who had nothing but good intentions, really, but it wasn't organic to what I wanted to be doing, and I knew that in my core. Megan uses words and expressions that she thinks make her sound as profound as her website. First of all, she says she knew this in her core, and secondly, this is the second time she uses the adjective organic in an unexpected context. The first time was when she said she had an organic love of food and travel. I guess I don't have the complexity to even know what that means. And this second time isn't much better. However, it's another rehearsed word, one that we were all fortunate enough to hear early on. So, so for both of us, it was just a really authentic and organic way to get to know each other. This is impression management. Megan seeks to guide people's perception of her. Instead of letting people make their own conclusions, that what she does is organic or authentic or whatever, she already has the answer for them. She has every right to communicate in this way, of course. What's relevant is that this way of communicating doesn't sit right with a lot of people. We can control the encoding of our statements, but we can't always control the decoding, how our statements will be perceived. Megan seeks to control both. And I think especially the surprise factor of it is that, you know, my castmate uh, Gina Torres, who plays Jessica on the show, she gave me some advice a couple years ago, and she will say it often. She calls me nutmeg, but she'll be like, nutmeg, just leave room for magic. Four days later, I got an email from one of the highest executives for UN Women saying they wanted to work with me. 
I thought it was a joke. I was like, the United Nations wants to work with me because I wrote this thing on my blog. But they did. Um, this is classic humble brag. Humble brag is defined as an ostensibly modest or self-critical statement whose actual purpose is to draw attention to something of which one is proud. Megan's obviously proud to have been contacted by this organization, but she disguises this by downplaying her blog all of a sudden. I thought it was a joke. I was like, the United Nations wants to work with me because I wrote this thing on my blog, but they did. After she just spent five minutes talking about how magical, extraordinary and profound it is. This is key in identifying humble brag. When speakers who like talking about themselves suddenly downplay a certain aspect of their alleged achievements or personality in order to make them sound even more extraordinary. Just ask Amber Heard who uses the word selfishly, talking about how much she loves to help people, which is the point she actually wants to get across. I selfishly found relief in being able to use what I've lived through to advocate for others. To, to bring light to these issues, to give a voice to people who don't have the voice and the platform that I have. The humble brag resurfaces later on, and it seems there's no end to these funny stories. Try not to laugh too much. And I couldn't afford to fix this car, and this was how I got from one audition to the other. So open my trunk and like play it off, like look around and be like, oh, I'm just digging for a headshot or a highlighter, Just crawl, out crawl the into the back of my car, pull the trunk, and then climb to the front seat to drive off to my next audition. But it's the stuff that we do. And, <laughs> and it's part of why I think, like, why I connected things like Darling at Magazine or, you know, part of why I think it's really important to have that candid quality on the TIG is that you have to share stories like that. Suits is not... What I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I never thought that I'd have a show that went for this long. That's crazy. I was a girl that auditioned and crawled in through the back seat of my car. So, you know, I think all of those pieces of it, if you're real about it and you don't, and you don't just say like, oh yeah, this is so fabulous. I have a stylist and I have all this stuff. It's like every day I'm like, there's a fruit basket in my trailer. <laughs> what? Um, I don't think I can do this. Seriously. We're recording this? I was just joking. Let's take a closer look at this passage. The point about her car being old and small is the self-critical or modest statement she uses to highlight the alleged huge success with the show. Once again, Megan's busy with the impression management, drawing the conclusions for the audience that it's crazy for a show to have 134 episodes, even though it isn't, and that her life is awesome, which is a strange thing for people to say if they have an awesome life. Before the self-repair, she was about to say something less positive about Suits, so the awesome part sounds like overcompensation. Suits is not what I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I this has to be one of the least empowering interviews I've ever seen. What she says is disguised as empowerment advice, but it's really about making what she's achieved sound special, or maybe even unattainable. We recognize this pattern from her One Young World speech. Here, she was expected to address the work of the young people in this pointless, agenda-filled organization, but instead she made it about her own road to success. It was several years ago in 2014, that I was first invited to be a counselor at One Young World. Young, ambitious, advocating for the things I deeply and profoundly believed in. And also looking around and wondering, how on earth did I get here? <laughs> Have any of you today so far had that feeling, that pinch me moment where you just go, how am I here? Oh, it's a lot. And I was invited to pull up a seat at the table and proof that I belonged. They saw in me the present and the future. So to meet again here on UK soil with him by my side makes it all feel full circle. The full circle claim is demonstrably unreliable. At this point in time, Meghan and Harry had long since left the UK with no family and only few supporters behind them so it couldn't have felt full circle coming back to the UK. 
And that's the point. All these interviews and speeches are about delivering nice-sounding monologues, as if they were auditions. The form of the monologues, the buzzwords, is primary, and the content, the truth value of the monologues, is secondary, to say the least. The impression management continues. And there's a really big push for me to work with female entrepreneurs, and then all the influencers that I interview on this site, be it friends or you know high-profile people that I reach out to, there always has to be some sort of philanthropic element as well. Like, I think it's great if you're fabulous, but I think you're more fabulous if you do something of value in this world. Um, However, the depth of the philanthropy Megan claims to be doing is exposed by the lack of depth of her ideology. In the following, Megan makes an empowering observation, but notice what's lacking. I uh, went to Rwanda for a field mission to meet with female parliamentarians in Rwanda. Uh, it's an incredible country which has the highest percentage of female parliamentarians of any government in the world. 64% of their Congress is female, which is amazing. amazing. Um, and so I did that trip with them and then it just continued to open so many doors and I think... This is the same rehearsed passage she repeated in her interview with Larry King and it lacks the real reason for this overrepresentation. A point she reluctantly admitted in her interview with King. With all the problems Rwanda has had, mm -hmm. how do you explain this seemingly contradiction? I think it's really, you know, truly, and especially being there on the ground, it was so interesting to see that in the wake of, obviously, such a horrendous experience that they had, which was not much more than 20 years ago or so, right? We're talking something that was fairly recent. Yeah. And in that... Yes, A, so many of the men were lost in the genocide, so it gave women an opportunity to either succumb to that or to then find some strength and then mobilize in a way that was really empowering. And I think that's specifically what they've done, which is a great benchmark for what women all over the world could be doing. She doesn't use the conjunction but, but implicitly it's there because there's rising yes, intonation on the last the word, the foreshadowing an upcoming contrast and with the same function as said conjunction. Then she uses the misplaced positive word in power, as if there's anything positive about this tragic history. Morally speaking, knowing the context behind this overrepresentation, the word amazing doesn't belong here. However, the word reveals the superficial worldview and deceptive empowerment ideals that caused it. Sadly, empowerment has become an effective way to disguise self-interest and self-glorification. It's also interesting that she praises the overrepresentation when she calls herself a proponent of equality. But that's the thing with Megan and like minded people on colleges all over the Western world. They actually want favoritism, but of course they can't call it that. They want to be favored because of their innate characteristics, and this is where buzzwords and victim narratives come into the picture. I can't help a final point about Megan's previous phrase, in my, in core. my core. If there's one thing all the interviews I've analyzed have in common, it's that she seems to have very little core. The rehearsed monologues, buzzwords, and lack of specifics don't make her sound very firm in her ideological views. And the self-branding doesn't make it sound like the causes she's paid to advocate for are of primary concern. The lack of core is also apparent from watching her interviews. Of course, settings and topics are different, and thus interviewees adapt to them. However, unlike Catherine and William, or even Harry for that matter, Meghan's entire personality changes from interview to interview, precisely as if she's auditioning for different roles. The difference in demeanor between the Humblebrag story. For whatever reason, the trunk would still open with the key. Open my trunk and like play it off, like look around and be like, oh, I'm just digging for a headshot or a highlighter. What I ever thought my, I never thought my life would be that awesome. I and the overly sweet engagement interview is striking. Oh, it would be a year and a half to yeah. a little bit more than that. No, just about, about, just about a year and a half, that. yeah. It's, um, we made it work. However, there are moments when the mask drops. Uh, mm. Yes, we first met, we were introduced actually by a mutual friend who um, we will... We should protect her privacy. Protect her privacy, yeah. Real too much of that. And um, for us, it's it's an opportunity to to really get to know each other without other people, you know, looking mm -hmm. or trying to take photos on their phones and all that kind of stuff. You know, with that, that comes, that comes, comes with the, comes with the job, comes with the role, but... Um,
which is exactly why her statements and body language come across as contrived. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some lawn mowing to do. I think it will be another amazing experience in my awesome life. I hope it's empowering for you to know that. See you next time for a video that's organic to what I want to say.